The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thanks for joining us this morning, folks. We'll begin right at the top of the hour in about three minutes. All right, folks, uh, we're going to begin now, and, and I want to begin by saying I am deeply humbled. We have set another attendance record, and I'm very, very excited about that. Um, I do want to take this time to introduce our special guest this time, who will be uh, adding and providing comments throughout the, uh, the webinar broadcast. Terry Fortner uh, from Fortner Advisory and Development, LLC. Terry uh, comes to us as a seasoned veteran in the collision repair industry. He has over 45 years of experience, and I guess that means, Terry, you started when you were six or seven in the industry. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he has a career that uh, spanned 32 years at Nationwide Insurance, taking early retirement in 2009. His last role there was as Vice President of Material Damage Claims, and that's actually where I got to know Terry uh, in the early 2000s when he was at Nationwide. After leaving yep. Nationwide, Terry joined LKQ Corporation as the Vice President of Industry Relations uh, and Marketing Development. His last role at uh, LKQ Corp, however, was uh, as Vice President of sales and marketing for all of North America. His role included uh, European uh, United Kingdom insurance and collision repair marketing responsibility um, during that tenure at LKQ. So a wealth of experience. And of course, what happens after you retire, you don't stay idle for too long. And Terry formed a boutique consulting firm, firm sorry, uh, Fortner Advisory and Development. He is working part-time with uh, select clients. One of his major clients includes CAPA, the Certified Aftermarket Parts Association, um, and we're going to get him to weigh in on what he's doing there. Um, and so with that, uh, Terry, any initial comments before we dig in? Uh, Greg, thank you for uh, inviting me. It's uh, always an honor to spend time with you, especially uh, on this call. And I think, why don't we just go ahead and get started? I know uh, looking at the slides and whatnot, we've got a lot to cover today. Yeah, we do indeed. So let's uh, let's begin by going over our agenda. So what we're going to cover here is we're going to give you the latest uh, update on Kia and Hyundai news, and there's a new development in Kia vehicles I wanted to uh, to let everybody know about. 
Then we're going to look at uh, the latest on the Port of Los Angeles. And there's an exciting news announcement that I literally got about an hour ago. Um, so I'll bring everybody up to speed on that. We're going to look at the future of microchip manufacture throughout the world um, and a big expansion that was recently announced in the US. We're going to look at uh, the newest EV accident trends. AXA came out with a pretty interesting study. And then also um, some input from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety on the uh, what happens when an electric vehicle hits a conventional uh, internal combustion in an engine vehicle. Uh, also a reversal on a decision made by Ford on equipping their vehicles with AM radios, and we'll go into why. Then, of course, we always talk about the latest parts price inflation, uh, as well as our uh, delivery times by part type, by state, et cetera. And then lastly, we're going to have uh, a brief Q&A with Mr. Fortner. So with no further ado, um, Hyundai has actually introduced a pretty interesting system. They call it Hyundai Mobis. And if you look really closely at this picture, you're going to see that there are four wheel motors uh, with a pivoting shock absorber. And it's going to be brake by wire, steer by wire um, with a, a wheel hub motor. This was a demo car that Hyundai uh, demonstrated recently. And let me show you a a little bit more in detail. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, videos are worth even more than that. So let's go and look at a video. So you can see this is their crab driving. This is to uh, help the vehicle go into a, a tight parking space. They also have the zero turns, or if you're on a very narrow one way street, you can do a zero radius turn, which is pretty impressive. And uh, then this is interesting. This is all in the idea of accident avoidance. So it is that, that very quick diagonal turn um, that can be done at speed. So pretty interesting technology. You know, the first thing I think of as a former insurance guy is, boy, as soon as I get a hit on that wheel, that's gonna cost some money. Um, the pivoting turn is pretty interesting too. Um, and we look at, at some pretty interesting functionality. But the thing that always surprises me is when I look at that crab driving, which is I need to access a very tight space. That's pretty cool. But then I always wonder, aren't the other cars in front and behind you going to have to smash into your bumper to get out of their tight parking space? So always interesting. But um, I wanted to include this because some of the feedback I got from our last one was, gosh, you know, you're really dumping a lot on, on Kia and Hyundai. So without further ado, I'm going to dump on Kia and Hyundai some more. But um, Hey, Greg, Greg, yeah. let, me, let me ask, are, are they bringing this to the U.S. anytime soon? Well, it's, it's a Mobis uh, prototype that they did premiere in Korea. So they haven't really announced that they're doing anything in the U.S. market as of yet. But we'll see because, you know, the the if uh, we remember the first sort of four wheel drive steering vehicle that came uh, to the U.S. market was the Honda Prelude back in in the early days of the uh, early 90s. And then, of course, General Motors with their uh, Escalade and Suburban with four wheel steering. Um, so this is always, you know, it's it's something that there seems to be an appetite for. We'll have to see, you know, when they decide to bring it into the U.S. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Sure. Um, but the interesting thing is that Kia and Hyundai have reached a settlement in their class action suit, and it's uh, valued at over two hundred million dollars, and it's due to the the Kia. Kia Boys Challenge on TikTok, where everyone was educated fairly quickly on the internet on how easy these vehicles were to uh, to steal. Um, the settlement covers over nine million U.S. Uh, Kia Hyundai owners, inclu includes up to 145 million dollars in coverage for out-of-pocket losses 
for consumers that and vehicle owners who had their vehicle stolen. This equates to about $6,300 of out-of-pocket expenses, plus up to an additional $4,000 in associated costs, including uh, increased insurance premiums. Um, and as usual, you know, the the uh, the automaker said that they were going to uh, uh, share the, um, or sorry, do upgrades uh, on the 8.3 million vehicles uh, that are cu currently equipped with with uh, without the anti theft mobilizers. The interesting thing, though, is that now um, the cities that are impacted, City of St. Louis filed a lawsuit against Kia and Hyundai saying that the, uh, over 61% of all vehicles stolen in the last year in the city of St. Louis have been Kias and Hyundais, and that those vehicles make up 88% of reported uh, attempted thefts as well. So it's a big, big chunk of it. And of course, other cities have joined in very, very quickly, Cleveland, San Diego, Milwaukee, Columbus, and Seattle. The only parties that I do not see filing a class action suit against Kia and Hyundai are the insurance companies. Terry, do you think that's possible? Do you think? Uh, um, well, I, yeah. <laughs> to be determined, I would think, Greg, but uh, yeah. um, I could see that potential. Uh, how about yourself? Yeah, it's interesting because it does go beyond the normal subrogation because it is a a known manufacturer defect. So I think there's a potential uh, to have a, a national class action suit certified. So we'll see. But it is, as you say, to be determined. So we'll see what happens. Um, and as I uh, had mentioned earlier, we're going to talk about delays in the port. And if you recall last time, uh, we had our webinar. I had talked about the uh, ILWU uh, going away from the staggered lunch and dinner times and going to a group uh, lunch and dinner. That meant shutting down the port for more than two hours every day across all of the West Coast ports. That was uh, a bit of posturing by the ILWU, in my opinion. Uh, and we did start to see significant delays from that. And then recently, we saw in Seattle and Port of Los Angeles, wildcat strikes where they would just walk off the job in a single port or a single uh, lane so that the ship would have to, to uh, be delayed in unpacking. And so we were starting to see an uptick that was rivaling uh, the COVID peak. So it was really, really um, interesting. And they had been without a contract since July of last year. Um, and just this morning, uh, the PMA, the Pacific Maritime Association, which is the, really the management of the West Coast ports and the uh, ILWU, they have tentatively announced an agreement for a six-year contract covering all the workers at the 29 West Coast ports, which is really good news. That still has to be ratified. So as they say, it ain't over till it's over. But this is a really, really positive uh, you know, uh, development, and it looks like we dodged a bullet. Uh, Terry, you and I had a conversation recently on what this could mean if this strike was long term. Do you want to give us some highlights of that? Yeah, I, you know, as, as we know, uh, the majority of the aftermarket crash parts, as well as many of the uh, OE parts uh, uh, and ancillary products in collision repair are uh, uh, transported via cargo, uh, a lot coming out obviously of Asia. And generally you're talking 90 to 120 days of uh, float time uh, from port to port. Um, and so uh, if, if this had have continued, uh, would it have been uh, uh, supply chain issue too? The, the industry would have been facing potentially so, uh, uh, but there, there's about a, a, a 90 to uh, 120 day gap there. Um, I was actually uh, in a uh, conducting an industry advisory council yesterday, and uh, 
three uh, aftermarket distributors participated. In chatting with them, uh, they spoke very highly of their inventory and it being very robust. Uh, back on uh, not completely to 2019 level, but close to 2019 level. So to your point, Greg, it appears that we dodged uh, the the bullet, so to speak, on this one. Good deal. Yeah, the other thing that we saw last time was a, a pretty big increase in the rental costs of those 80 foot containers. And that of course gets passed on to the aftermarket parts distributors in the US and then Absolutely. eventually to the consumers. But it looks like we have avoided that because of the longer term contracts of these uh, parts manufacturers with the container rental companies. It looks like we're not gonna see uh, that sort of uh, trickle down of, of increased rentals. So everyone I think in, uh, in this industry can breathe a sigh of relief. Absolutely. All right. And the other big thing that has really impacted uh, new vehicle sales, new vehicle production, raised the value of used cars to an incredible level is the microchip shortage in the semiconductor uh, supply chain. So I was reading an article um, earlier in the year about uh, the global semiconductor industry and they published this survey and I'm always a little bit uh, skittish when, when an industry publishes a survey about their own industry, but this was interesting that 65% of the respondents in the industry believed that the situation would improve. Um, there were 15% who were apparently delusional and believed that the chip shortage was uh, balanced huh. already. <laughs> and 20% uh, believe that it, um, it will improve. So, uh, or sorry, that it will last beyond 2023. So interesting respondents in, and it comes also on the heels of uh, the Taiwanese Semiconductor Corporation expanding uh, and announcing that they are going to build a second chip plant in Arizona. You know, we had reported on before um, that they were building a beautiful greenfield uh, facility that is going to be going online in 2024. But recently, they've uh, more than doubled down, they've tripled down. They're going to triple their U.S. investment and build a three nanometer, uh, which is the the most uh, advanced uh, semiconductor manufacturing plant outside of Taiwan. So it's a huge, huge investment. Um, they believe that will come online in 2026. And they've also announced that um, they've made an $11 billion investment in Saxony, Germany, which is outside of, it's the the uh, state outside of Berlin. Um, so TSMC is is expanding beyond Taiwan, which I think is, is, you know, given the political climate between mainland China and the Republic of China, I think that's a great idea. Terry, anything you want to add on that? Uh, I think this is good to see. I think it's good for the industry, and uh, it sure would be nice to see that production even faster. Yep, agreed. Um, you know, and, and uh, our production in, in the U.S. is getting back to normal. We expect we'll still sell about 15.3 million new vehicles this year. A little bit off our pre-COVID levels were about 16.3 million, so we're about a, a million vehicles under. Um, but as we resolve this issue and the uh, supply of new vehicles matches demand, that will uh, filter through the rest of the industry and mean that uh, used car prices will get back to normal levels, hopefully. Uh, you know, the supply of salvage will return in the harvesting versus the rebuilders and uh, will return back to normal. Um, the latest on electric vehicles, um, pretty interesting 
thing that the uh, Tesla Model 3 now with over 800,000 units sold is the all-time sales high for a full battery electric vehicle. EVs now, as of the first quarter of 2023, capture 7% of new vehicle sales, which is literally double what it was in the first quarter of 2022. And the number of choices, you'll see that Mercedes-Benz launched seven new models of full EVs. You see price reductions from Tesla. You see more and more vehicle types. The ID Buzz uh, VW van is coming out. Um, later this year so there's a lot of vehicle models available so now the the share of evs in the u.s car park is 3.69 million um, to give you an idea that's roughly about one percent we have 370 million light vehicles registered in the u.s um, which is amazing we have more vehicles registered than we have licensed drivers uh, and to that, I say two things. One is, ain't America great? And secondly, I am doing my best <laughs> to contribute to that. Uh, the only thing that, that prevents me from owning more vehicles is my HOA. So there you go. Um, now, interestingly, European insurer AXA uh, released a study of EVs in their European markets, and they find that EVs are involved in 50% more traffic accidents than their internal combustion engine counterparts. And Terry, you and I had a conversation on this as well, and you had an interesting perspective that I didn't think of, and let's let's hear it. Well, again. yeah, yeah, Greg, we, we talked about how fast they are. I mean, you look, if those of you that either own a Tesla or driven one, they are rocket ships, and then the weight uh, the weight of the vehicle, but what uh, I brought up, if you think about the owners of electric vehicles, if you look at the demographics, the demographics will reflect that they are uh, generally in uh, in cities and in highly po uh, populated areas, which with the density uh, creates more likelihood of uh, accidents as opposed to being in the countryside. Yep. And that, that is a great point because that's not something that was addressed by AXA. Um, IHS did talk about uh, the significant weight increases and how it inflicts more damage because of the, the weight on the vehicles they hit. But I, I completely agree, and it was one of those aha moments um, in our conversation that totally makes sense because of the charging station availability, because of the urban, uh, you know, nature, the demographic of of EV buyers. It makes all the sense in the world um, that those accident rates would be higher. And I can tell you, as an EV owner, uh, and mine's not one of the faster ones. You you mentioned that Teslas are rocket ships, and they truly are. Um, my ID4 has a zero to sixty of like five point four seconds, which is plenty fast. Um, but I see uh, my driving habits change, probably not for the better, when I get behind the wheel of the EV because of the instant response and uh, just the the very smooth power band. Now, we had mentioned um, the curb weight impacting, and I want everybody to look at these six vehicles and pick the one they think is the lightest. And... We won't take an official survey, but just keep it in mind if what you think is the lightest. And here it is. It's the Hyundai Ionic 5 at 4662, which is pretty heavy. When you think the average uh, passenger car, which is what will qualify this, not really as a crossover, it's more of a, of a passenger car, weighs in at about 3,700 pounds. That's a big, big weight difference. The real surprise here um, that the Tesla Model S, not the 3, but the S is the next lightest vehicle at 4,766. My car, my ID4 is a heifer at 4,877 pounds. Uh, lastly, or next is the Mustang Mach-E at 4,920 pounds. And that holds the record for the heaviest Mustang. Uh, a little bit of background, the previous record holder for the heaviest Mustang was the 07 to 2010 
GT500 convertible. It weighed in at 4,040 pounds. Um, and for uh, data geeks like me, the lightest Mustang ever produced was the 79 Fox body, weighing in at only 2,515 pounds. With then that was with a manual transmission and a 302. So these things are super heavy. As we get into the large SUVs and trucks, the the numbers increase dramatically. The the Rivian RT1 at 7,148 pounds. That is quite a fulcrum when it hits another car. That's going to push that other car pretty effectively. And this is the record holder, the Hummer EV at over 9,000 pounds of gross vehicle weight. Just amazing. Um, and interestingly enough, this, you know, I, I've been a lot of uh, chat groups on the internet with EVs in follow Lucid, Rivian, Tesla, et cetera. And uh, this co report comes from. Uh, an owner of an R R1T, and he was rear-ended by this uh, poor driver uh, in a Toyota, and it looked like it was just a uh, you know an impacted rear bumper. But he took it to his certified Rivian shop, and they came up. And you can see a full tear down here, including removing the entire bed of forty-two thousand dollars. The initial estimate that was done with photo-based estimating, as you would see in a normal. <laughs> Insurance triage was $1,600. Um, and Terry, I wanted to get your thoughts because there are a lot of things going on here. You know, it's a certified repair. Um, it is fully blueprinted by the looks of this, but also um, the, the triaging um, seems to have missed the mark by a bit on the insurance. Oh, company. yeah, ab absolutely it did. And, and if you think about the, uh, the person that hit the Rivian, uh, Hopefully they had more than minimum limits on their coverage, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> I got to tell you, um, I, that that would be an interesting bet because it's an older uh, vehicle, and uh, I don't know. It. I. I hope they did, or at least the Rivian owner had underinsured motorist. So. <laughs> exactly. But there'd still be subrogating back, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and at you know switching gears a little bit, as I mentioned, you know the the uh, Ford had announced earlier um, and had already done it on the Mach E and the F-150 Lightning that they were discontinuing AM radios. Um, CEO Jim Farley reversed their decision by saying after he was speaking with policy leaders, there was an important element of AM broadcast radio as part of the emergency alert system. Um, it's interesting that Ford had gone all the way down the path of saying this isn't needed, you know, AM radio, um, you can do without your sports uh, play-by-plays or your conservative talk radio um, and missed out on the idea that this was part of the emergency broadcast system. So good news. The reason we had mentioned in our last webinar that AM radio uh, is a challenge with EVs is that the, the broadcast frequency interferes with or you get a lot of interference from the electric motor and the, the car battery. So in order to restore AM radio, it has to be streamed through a different source. Um, but Ford has made the uh, reverse decision and now they will equip AM radios in all of their vehicles going forward. Good news. Um, to keep AM radio in the car. Switching gears pretty pretty quickly, we're going to look, as we always do, uh, at the median delivery times. Um, and we're going to start up on the upper left hand, and you'll see the gray bars and then the blue dashes. So we look at the median delivery days in the blue dashes. And this is for all part types. You can see ordered part types, and we see the pie of uh, delivery days in the lower left. But the blue bar identifies what is the median delivery day. And it's just over uh, one day, which is what you would expect. You know, the milk runs. This is for all part types. So it's the recycled aftermarket as well as the multiple OE deliveries. But what we wanted to do um, by looking at the average, if you've got 10 parts on the average estimate, and say you get nine on time in that one day delivery time, but 
there is one backordered part or one delayed part. By looking at the median plus two standard deviations, you capture 95% of the population. So you get those outliers. And averaging dilutes the impact. You know, if you have one part out of 10 that is significantly delayed, it is sort of diluted by the other ones that are arriving on time. So what this chart does is says, look, you know, of those 10 parts, were they any delayed? Yes, there was a one delayed or more. And by how many days was that delayed? So right through the end of May, we are at 11.9 days uh, looking at the median plus two standard deviations. The good news is, is that is the lowest you can see from the chart in the last year and a half almost. So good signs that we're returning towards uh, more uh, on-time deliveries, fewer back-ordered parts. When we look at the standard deviation by make, um, we see that the, the more red, the darker the red, we can see that Acura is the outlier with 25.1 days uh, Mazda at 21.1, Honda at 17.7, and BMW at 19.3. So those are the outliers when we look at all part types. Um, and then we'll weigh it. And this is truly being driven by the OEs. And it's not to call out the OEs, but they are responsible for providing these you know, restraint systems that can only be purchased new OE specific trim parts that are not produced by the aftermarket or not readily available in the recycled environment. Um, so it's it's not a calling out in a negative way of the OEs, it's just the reality of it. The interesting thing is that we see with fair consistency that Honda, Acura, Mazda are having the biggest issues. The only other interesting piece here is BMW, um, also struggling a little bit. Again, a lot of the reason that uh, Honda, Acura, Mazda, and BMW have these issues is that a lot of their trim pieces are still manufactured in most cases in Asia, but in BMW's case uh, in Germany. So while they do some manufacturing outside of uh, their home base in the US, we have BMW and, and Honda assembly plants, there is uh, the the dependent trim pieces that are still being manufactured in in their home countries and therefore we're having some delays. When we look at aftermarket in particular, there is a uh, radically different look at it. One is when we look at the median plus two standard deviations, you know, we were looking at 11.9 days before, we're looking at 3.1 days. So not a lot of delay when it comes to aftermarket parts overall. And we only see two outliers, Dodge and Mercedes-Benz. And, and Terry, I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on a couple of things. You know, your previous company, you had multiple milk runs, right? And delivered those oh, yeah. parts uh, at pretty much as soon as they were ordered. Um, what would cause a delay? Um, on one of those parts of up to you know three days. Any of these? Oh, uh, if the if the part was uh, maybe a state away uh, where it was uh, shipped in from uh, another warehouse, uh, that could uh, create a day or so delay. That would be the main reason. Okay. Um, and I would. I, it, it was interesting to me. Um, that Mercedes um, showed up there. And, you know, it, the interesting thing about Mercedes is it really is uh, limited in, in my mind, the aftermarket uh, parts to those highest volume ones like the C-Class and the GLA. Um, any thoughts on, on that particular thing? Yeah, if you look at the volume of Mercedes parts, it's going to be uh, in the lower group Greg, uh, now Dodge, uh, not so very very popular, right? Um, on, on the aftermarket with a, a lot of available parts, but Mercedes 
uh, less available available parts, uh, either in Kappa or non Kappa. Good deal. And when we look at um, the recycled part, we see a couple of things. There's a slight uptick from 3.5 to 3.7 days on that, uh, you know, median plus two standard deviation. So um, fairly consistent. Again, we're looking at a much different scale than the OE. We're all in the in the three days for the entire, you know, three and a and a bit days in 2023. Outlier again is Mercedes Benz, and interestingly enough, the truck division of Dodge is with Rams, and that is interesting to me. My thought is that with Mercedes, it's likely um, availability. Terry, would you think because Mercedes are uh, yeah, better candidates for yeah, rebuilding? Yeah, and, and and the fact that uh, if you look in the normal recycling facility. Mercedes again is going to be a lower volume, but when you uh, ship in uh, whoever the recycler might be, when they're shipping a part in, then it's it's going to create you know a longer time frame. Uh, yeah. And uh, when you start your search with and Mercedes parts, obviously being more expensive and being maybe two states away. Uh, to find that part, and you're willing maybe to wait uh, due to the the price savings uh, to bring that part in. So I, I would think that would be the main reason. Excellent. Ram is is, is unusual, is absolutely unusual, but a very popular truck, right? And mm-hmm. pickup truck salvage, a lot of fleets are are Ram. Uh, so. Uh, that that could be. I think a lot of that has to be, be with with RAM is the demand, the demand being very high. Good point because they are. Um, you see a lot of fleets because they do a lot of fleet deals for, for the RAM truck. Exactly. Good deal. Then we're going to look at at uh, the average price. We we did this inflationary trend. So this is looking at the average price per part by part type. Uh, And what we've called out previously is um, the remanufactured inflationary rate. And we we really pin that on the idea that uh, remanufacturing in today's world is down to almost entirely remanufacturing of alloy wheels. Um, And there is a demand and, uh, you know, the the, uh, ability for these technicians to be hired in and and do these remanufacturing has, has, you know, in the post-COVID world, cost, you know, has risen because of that. And we also see a little bit of a trend towards the increasing of the actual diameter of the alloy wheel. Terry, you know, LKQ owned uh, one of the biggest remanufacturers of alloy wheels in the in the country. Any thoughts you have on that? Uh, well, uh, obviously, with uh, uh, remanufacturing wheels, you've got the mobile, then you've got the full, uh, and LKQ uh, uh, is not in the in the mobile business, to my knowledge, unless it's a side lap. But anyway, uh, in in the the mobile repair with the the reman is uh, uh, obviously available, especially in metropolitan areas. And so many with the recycle wheel, uh, remanufacturing wheel, you take a recycle wheel and you remanufacture it. If, if there is a significant damage to it, it's basically being cored out and going to the smelter and not being repaired. Okay. The other thing that we had pointed out earlier uh, in our earlier broadcast was the uh, when we look at the average aftermarket and OEM new price, people were surprised that uh, they were so closely tied. For reference, they're the bottom two um, lines on the chart. And in 20, the end of 2022, they sort of converged. And you see that happening. And then actually, the OEM new starting to tick up a little bit. And a couple of folks in the industry had called me out and said, you know, 
that's not really a fair comparison because you're looking at all part types because the again you know like we saw in the delivery days piece the oe has to supply every part so you're going to get those you know lower priced emblems clips etc so really what you should do is do a like to like comparison so looking at that feedback we did exactly that if you look over at the right it says top pet part category we did uh, bumpers doors fenders lamps hoods etc and this really tells a, a really interesting story uh, if you look at the uh, 2020 21 and 22 charts and overlaid a trend chart you would see a pretty close relation in, in the inflationary trend overall what we see so far in 2023 is a diversion of the of the trend when it comes to uh, OEM versus aftermarket. You see, absolutely, the aftermarket has has stabilized and gone down by two dollars from the end of 2022. But we start to see an uptick in the OEM average part price. Um, and Terry, I wanted to get your thoughts on that as well. That was an eye opener for me. Greg, I, I think a lot of this uh, is uh, is driven by, uh, if we go back to supply chain, uh, the aftermarket uh, was seeing, again, product coming in from Asia and being on the water and the increased cost uh, and having to pass that on. And, you're, and there was uh, such a shortage of, of product and uh, the, uh, with labor costs and fuel costs, et cetera. Uh, but now the, the cargo costs, the fuel costs haven't uh, uh, declined, obviously, but the cargo cost has provided some relief there. So I think that maybe weighs in on it. Then I think you have to look at the, the technology in the uh, OE part and uh, the added technology and so I, I think that would be a couple of factors. Excellent. Good feedback. And now what I want to do is turn over to uh, to our special guest and ask him some questions. Um, and it, it harkens back to uh, your days at LKQ. Um, and I always, when when people to me when they say North American responsibility, I automatically say, ah, that means Canada as well. So what are some of the market differences between the US and Canada? Uh, Greg, it's uh, it, both are, are similar in a lot of ways, I would tell you. Um, the the uh, But there are some significant differences. Well, the first thing you have to realize is the exchange rate. Uh, the delta being about 25%. So uh, that uh, obviously uh, creates uh, some differences, uh, especially if you're bringing product uh, over over the border, right? Uh, coming or going. So you have to be wise there uh, financially. Um, in, uh, in Canada, there is no CCC estimating or total loss or technology system. So CCC, uh, I believe at one time they were there, but it's been, uh, they exited some time ago. And uh, Mitchell and Solera uh, are the two estimating uh, companies there. So big difference there. Uh, one of the part uh, marketplace uh, players, the, uh, the biggest is a company named Progy. Uh, and ProG is a third-party um, um, parts management uh, system uh, that is not in the U.S. Uh, and uh, is in fact is used by in Canada by Intact, who is the number one uh, insurance market share leader in Canada. When you look at the alternate parts usage, or on the contrary, look at the OE uh, parts usage. It's similar, however, uh, uh, alternate parts uh, usage is a little bit lower in Canada. 
uh, around uh, 400 basis points, somewhere around there. So another difference. Uh, another significant difference is in uh, five of the provinces, uh, there is, excuse me, uh, yes, five, uh, wrong again, four. Uh, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Quebec for liability only uh, have governmental auto insurance. Mm -hmm. So there are four of those, and uh, which is different. And in course, in in uh, on uh, with Quebec, Montreal, Quebec City, etc., you have a lot of French speaking. And then uh, another significant difference is. Yeah, there are basically six or so uh, MSO, they call them banner groups in Canada that uh, uh, control the high percentage or complete the high percentage of insurance paid collision repairs. So that is a long answer to a question, but uh, <laughs> about six, six uh, significant factors. Good to know. So it's more than just hockey and Tim Hortons. Okay. Yeah. So you are consulting for for Kappa. Um, we have some good strategic relationships at Parts Trader with with uh, Kappa. So how's that going, and and how are they doing and expanding now that uh, you know they're the only uh, certifier in town? Uh, they are doing extremely well. Uh, for uh, those on the call that may not be aware, or those that may need a little bit of reminder. Uh, Intertech, a uh, publicly traded uh, entity uh, based out of uh, England, has exclusive license agreement to manage the CAPA program. And they are simply fantastic with their U.S. headquarters being in Grand Rapids. In fact, I was just there for the last two days and uh, we held a uh, industry advisory council. Uh, they have a complete lab there where they do the vehicle testing, uh, a very impressive vehicle test fit. I would encourage people, the industry, to visit their um, industry veteran, Stacy Bartnick, uh, works for Intertech. Uh, Stacy does a great job with training and uh, providing the tours, and she's ab available for lab tours as well as training. Uh, the um, the Kappa organization still owns the standards. They have an independent board separate of Intertech. Uh, the board is uh, uh, membership is uh, insurance carriers, uh, colli major collision repairs, uh, collision repairs in general. Uh, Clark Pachinski is the chairman. Uh, so, uh, but the big thing is they have 56,000 certified part applications. And I will tell you, um, the Intertech organization does a great job. They have uh, 20 uh, engineers on the ground in shops, uh, or excuse me, in manufacturing facilities in Taiwan and China uh, each, uh, each day. So uh, it's, it's going extremely well. And they've been able to sort of um, cover the market when NSF exited the uh, auto parts certification uh, business. Kappa seems to have picked up that slack extremely well. They they have done a very good job. But uh, again, uh, for those of you not to bore people with details, but there was a difference in how NSF looked at certification compared to how Kappa standards where there were some differences, uh, but there has absolutely been no no slippage in quality. Uh, the there truly is a difference with a Kappa certified part. So there, as they say in the South, there's meat on the bone there. There's absolutely substance and uh, extremely impressive job what Intertech does for the industry. Good deal. So the other thing that I look at long term, um, and my son actually was trained in the collision industry as a sea level tech, um, and like a lot of other, uh, you know, younger folks, 
uh, didn't last long in the industry. What can this industry do? And then I'm talking about all participants, whether it's uh, manufacturers or uh, you know, repair centers or even insure, insurers. What can we do to grow the technician uh, shortage or you know, reduce the technician shortage by growing new techs for the industry? Well, I think probably everyone on this call has had that question asked to them or uh, has been asked to uh, weigh in on to answer that question. It's a, it's a difficult task we're up against, but it's not impossible. Um, I, there's some great organizations doing some phenomenal work. I think of what Caliber's doing, what Gerber's doing, what Crash Champions uh, is doing from a MSO standpoint with growing technicians. I think they're, they're doing some phenomenal work and they're truly investing in the future of the industry. And then uh, Collision Repair Ed Foundation, uh, which I was fortunate enough to be the, the chairman of the board uh, at one time, uh, and Brandon Eckenrode, and what that organization is doing. Uh, Enterprise Rental Car, uh, what they're doing to grow technicians and partnering with uh, technical uh, colleges and universities. Um, I, I think that's uh, growing it from, uh, if you will, the grassroots level. I think um, we have to start early. Uh, when early I'm talking about, you know, in middle school and no later than early high school. And we need more of the people in this audience to be disciples for the industry and talk about the good news. Um, one of the shortcomings, and this is personal, that I I believe I think there needs to be higher pay at the entry level. And uh, as we know, jobs are becoming more and more technical, and we need to tell that good story. Um, and there's so many specialties, whether it be diagnostic work, whether it be calibration work, whether it be paint work, whether it be uh, you know in the shop itself estimating, parts management, it goes on and on. It is a broad industry and um, you don't necessarily need a college degree. There are probably a lot of college graduates that aren't making the money of a seasoned uh, collision repair specialist. Um, and then in, in the future, I believe we will see technology enhance effic uh, efficiency and start filling some of the labor gaps, whether that be with AI, robotics, uh, uh, but I, I do believe that's the future. Excellent. I, I agree on all of those points, and I think that the um, the pathway showing high school kids potentially, and impor as importantly, their parents, that there is a career path beyond just the entry-level tech is is vital. You know, Greg, uh, we grew up touching, feeling, and and being around cars. You know, we uh, we changed tires, we changed oil, we did tune-ups. Uh, today's youth is not exposed to that because simply um, <laughs> there really is no tune-up for the Tesla, right? <laughs> this is true. This is true. And and so times have changed, my friend. And we we need we have to be evangelists for the industry. Completely agree. Completely agree. Um, and one more thing, you know, we we talked. You just mentioned that there's no tune-up for Tesla, but the the actual body construction, the vehicle construction, has more exotic materials of aluminum, magnesium, uh, composite plastic, carbon fiber. Can the aftermarket producers in Taiwan and, and mainland China, can they actually keep up with these new materials? Greg, by all means, uh, I don't see that uh, as, as an issue. What you have to keep in mind is that uh, most of the successful aftermarket manufacturers also produce OE parts, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you, if you look at TYC and Depot and the work that they're doing with lighting, uh, 
they are absolutely they're very bright uh strong engineering backgrounds um and so uh and, and, and you know if you look at a a kappa certified part again it is uh, uh the substance of the part the materials of the part are equal to that of the company car service part so I don't see that being an, uh, an issue going forward. Will it be easy? No, by no means will it be easy, but uh, I do believe that uh, they will produce results and be able to produce those parts. Excellent, yeah, that, that did strike me uh, as interesting when we went to a couple of the manufacturers in Taiwan the first time I went, was seeing their OE certifications for some of the major manufacturers we looked at a head, one of the headlight manufacturing companies and they had about a half a dozen uh, OE certifications hanging on their wall. That was interesting. So they are, you know, suppliers to the OE assembly lines. All right. Um, Terry, do you have time for one more question? Uh, absolutely. I think we've got okay. just a few more minutes left. We do, um, but this is always a, a little doozy. bit more gas in the tank, if you will, <laughs> or or, or char charge. What do you want to say? Yeah. So this is my my general. What what keeps you up at night, or what should keep insurers, repairers, and suppliers up at night? Well, I again going back to the uh, question on growing technicians, we we probably all ask ourselves this or, or face this uh, as, as we think about our day-to-day our -day jobs. Um, but I do have a few uh, that come to mind. One is uh, obviously labor and finding the technician, finding the, the quality employee. Um, you know, it's, it's absolutely a challenge. Um, uh, secondly, I would say safety, uh, especially around EVs with the technology changing and your earlier point with the growth in EV. Uh, so many safety risks uh, and uh, there is a shortage of, of training. Think of small town USA, there's a non-drive accident. Think of the many um, industry people that touch that claims process, the tow truck driver, the first responders, uh, uh, the uh, technician, uh, the, the storage facility, uh, the shop itself. And as we, we've all seen the videos of the, the, the EV burning um, and the unfortunate uh, and, and challenges from a health standpoint that technicians are exposed to, and the lack of training, I, it, it's, it's significant. And um, I, I think that's something that the industry can come together on uh, going forward. And it, as you look at, as you said earlier, the growth of EVs, uh, I, I, I'm not comfortable from what I read and, and see that the industry is growing fast enough, growing safety fast enough to keep up with the growth of EVs. And it, it's interesting, uh, not to get political, but the government uh, it doesn't seem to be encouraging it either. And then the other two things I, I would say is overall training uh, and uh, for the repair of the EVs and uh, inflation. Inflation uh, is, I mean, everybody sees it in their household every day. So, and, and can, uh, and, and carriers, I was with many of them this week, they have a challenge, you know, nobody wants to pay more for insurance, but yet uh, the costs are increasing significantly. So those are some of the things, Greg. Excellent, yeah, and I, I completely agree. You know, the, um, the government has been good about trying to, in their, still behind on trying to get the EV infrastructure built, but no one is really looking at the, uh, what uh, has always been sort of called the invisible industry, which is collision repair. No one thinks about it until they have an accident and have to get it repaired. Um, and I think that's probably the, the same thought as, you know, the bureaucrats in 
uh, state house and, and capital. They're not thinking of the collision repair. They're thinking about what to do to get the, the vehicles charged up. And with that, I wanted to thank you personally, Terry. Thank you, my friend, for uh, you know participating in, and uh, your insights. I truly appreciate it. Um, and for those that have attended, again, I'm humbled and I thank you very, very much for attending. And remember, every time you sign up for this, it's not necessary to see it live. We will uh, send out within the next day a uh, audio video recap of this so you'll get the entire broadcast so you can play it uh, later. So if you do sign up in the future and say, ah, I can't make it, that's fine. Encourage uh, friends uh, and colleagues in the industry to sign up and they will get a copy of this. Either you can see it live or um, we'll send you a copy within a day of the broadcast. And with that, Terry, thanks again. And uh, thank you, Greg. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Yep. Everyone, have a wonderful rest of the day and we will see you next time. We'll have information on our next broadcast coming out within the next month. Take care and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.